Well, let's read this passage in verse 13 um, through 18 of chapter 5. Verse 13 through 18. If anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. If anyone cheerful, let him sing praise. If anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Well, in this passage that we've just read together, uh, verses 13 through 15, they kind of hone in on a specific ministry of prayer. That's a ministry of the elders praying for the sick. Uh, but in verse 16, we, get, we focus in on a general ministry of prayer, which is the church members praying for each other as we confess our sin to each other. And this is the focus that I would like us to have this morning, uh, verse 16. So the, the title of our um, sermon, if it will click on uh, for us, is The Circle of Confession. The Circle of Confession. And... Um, this circle, you can't imagine, if it, it, of activity, it, it can begin with the confession of sin. That's what we have here in verse 16. We have a, a picture or a statement about the confession of sin. But it is to flow into a confession of Christ and his lordship. That is also a, an aspect of our confession as Christians. We confess our sin and we confess that Jesus is Lord. That same kind of language is used in Romans chapter 10. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we're to have this confession going on in our lives. And one is to lead to the other. And it will benefit us all as Christians and as a body of Christians if this cycle of confession is going on in our lives. It's an essential way that we thrive as Christians. So when we think about the definition of confession, we could simply say in its simplest form, it is saying, I have sinned. I have sinned. And a classic example in the Bible is the parable Jesus tells of the lost son who goes away, wastes his father's money and wealth, but he comes to a point where he comes back and he says to his father, I have sinned against God and before you. And he really means it. That's a great picture of confession. And as Christians were maybe most familiar with two types of confession. One is confession to God, personal, private confession to God, the kind of confession that we're told to make in that famous prayer, the Lord's Prayer, where we ask him to forgive us our sins, and it implies confession. But we're also aware of the type of confession that the Bible calls us to do when we have sinned against another brother or sister. And we are to go to them and sort it out. Uh, that's what we have. Um, let me see if I can find this. Uh, there we go. Matthew chapter 5. And it says there, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. That's confession. Then come and offer your gift. But our focus this morning is not on our private confession to God, 
And we're not going to focus in on that confession that we might make to somebody when we've sinned against them. But our focus this morning is on our confession to others of a repeated sin that is damaging us. A confession of an habitual sin or a besetting sin, as we might use that language. A sin where we are constantly struggling with that sin and we come to someone to confess it to them. That person that we confess it to, maybe we're not sinning against them. That's not the picture. We might be damaging someone else and we're certainly damaging ourselves. And that's an aspect of the type of sin that James is speaking about here when he says in verse 16, confess your sins to one another. That's, that's one aspect of the type of sin that he has in view. Yes, he has in view those what we might call smaller sins, um, those everyday sins where we might end up going to someone and saying, sorry, I was wrong. But he also has in view these deeper sins, these sins that we struggle with and we're wondering how we're going to overcome them. So here's a principle for church life. We are to confess our sin to one another. And we're just going to think about that in a bit more detail over four headings. And the first one is that the power is in prayer, not in confession. So the the power isn't in you confessing. The power for there to be healing, let's say, and a a recovery in the situation comes from the fact that prayer gets involved. So we, we see first the sequence, don't we, in verse 16. He says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So confession is given so that prayer may happen. It's vital. And When prayer happens, that can lead to healing. And when we talk about healing here, we're going to take it in its broadest sense, both the the spiritual healing that can happen, the overcoming of the sin, and possibly physical healing that may be even resulting because of that sin. But prayer is vital. So confession is never an end in itself, this type of confession. It's never an end in itself. It isn't just saying, I have sinned or I am sinning, and then experiencing relief. It isn't about getting it off your chest. You don't feel and get better just by confessing to someone. No, in this type of confession, confession is the beginning step It's it's that beginning of that cycle of confession that we mentioned. It has an aim and a purpose. And that aim and purpose is that someone would pray for you in your battle with sin. That you might break through into healing and break through into praise and confession of Christ in a fresh and new way. That's the cycle. Let's think about two things under this concept of prayer being the power. The first one is that we are to confess privately. So this is to be private confession. When it mentions in verse 16 there that we're to confess to one another, it doesn't have in view everybody. It has in view picking out someone that you really can trust uh, with your confession and confessing to them. Now, God does use public confession. Uh, he has used it, and he does use it. Uh, we can think about a, maybe the most classic example in the Old Testament of public confession was that famous day of atonement, that one day in the Jewish religious calendar where the whole people came together and there were two goats, and one was sacrificed and one was led out into the wilderness. And the one that was led out into the wilderness, the high priest would place his hands upon the goat and he would publicly confess the sins of the people. 
in more recent church history, we have known many times about revival, when the Holy Spirit of God has moved across a people or across a church, and he is the convicting spirit. He convicts us of sin, and there have been times when even in a meeting, in a public meeting, uh, confession has broken out. And people have confessed their sins. And God has moved mightily amongst the people. And if that were to happen to us at Hillfields Church Coventry, uh, good would come from that. There would be a humbling, but there would be a, a wonderful praise. There can be public confession sometimes in church discipline. If a brother or sister sins against the whole church then it can be appropriate that the confession is a public one. But what we often find with public confessions today is that they have been engineered or they've been forced and there's a a misguided approach about public confessions of sin and they do more damage than they do good. So we're not looking at that type of confession. This is one where we confess privately one to another. And it's worth clarifying and making clear, I think, that when we confess, uh, we don't confess our sin to someone to be forgiven. There's no priestly role going on in that sense between one, between one believer and another. Uh, the famous Christian of the 1500s, Martin Luther, when he looked at this verse 16, um, he was commenting about the, the kind of role that the priest has in the Catholic Church and how the priest is set up as someone able to forgive sins even and take the place of God in that way. Uh, Martin Luther simply says in verse, about verse 16, he says, it's a strange priest who is called one another. You see, we're to confess to one another as ordinary believers. So do remember that a Christian is forgiven completely when we trust in Jesus. That's when we are forgiven. If you put your trust in Jesus, then your past present and future sins, think about that, have been forgiven in the sacrifice of Jesus. And we even come to God and confess to him only that his forgiveness might be applied to us in a fresh way so that the the clouds of daily sin that have come between us and God can be kind of swept away and our relationship with him restored and his smile upon us again. We confess our sin to one another then that the other might pray for us. That's the key reason why we confess our sin to one another. So we are to confess our sin to one another. That's what James says right there in verse 16. This is how the church is to function. You know, we are familiar, aren't we, with many of the one another encouragements and exhortations in the Bible. Love one another, and we go after that. Be kind to one another. And we say, yes, I'm trying to live that out. Forgive one another as you have been forgiven, and you say, yes, I want to pursue that. But have we got it in our bloodstream? Confess your sin to one another. Just take it in. If we do not confess our sin to one another, who else will pray for us in a specific way? How's that going to happen? Listen to what Jesus said about prayer. He says, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. You will be healed. You will be helped. What an encouragement that is 
to confess, that there might be agreement in prayer, that someone might join with you in prayer. There is not only the power of prayer, but there is the power of agreement in prayer. And so we're encouraged to confess our sin and to pray and to be healed. So are you struggling with a constant sin, with a besetting sin? It could well be that you are. I certainly am. Have you shared it with anyone so that they might pray for you? If you're struggling with sin, the last thing you need to do is keep it in the shadows. You need more prayer. And if someone does confess their sins to you, they have taken a big step, haven't they, in doing that. And they need your prayers. If someone confesses their sins to you, let Romans chapter 12, verse 12, just guide you. It says, be persistent, be constant in prayer. Serve them in that way. Take it to heart. I will pray for you. And if you're saying, but my prayers, they haven't got the kind of power that you're talking about. Well, do look at the encouragement that James gives here in verse 16. He says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Do you know he's speaking about every Christian there? Every Christian is a righteous person, made righteous by Jesus Christ, having his righteousness credited to us. God sees us as righteous. He receives our prayers through Jesus And so our prayers find a place with him. And if someone asks you to pray for them, they confess their sin to you, and you actually have to acknowledge that you're wrestling with sin, then that's when you can confess also. Maybe to them or maybe to someone else that your prayers might be unblocked for the sake of them, and you might pray for each other. This is how the church is to function. So I wonder, how do you feel about this type of confession? Who would you confess to? Just stop and think about that. Who would you confess to? Would anyone confess to you? Would anyone confess to me? Am, am I giving off that gentleness enough, that openness, that spiritual depth, that reliability, that faithfulness, that concern that would mean they would seek me out? or seek you out? Do we have friendships that invite confession? Are we building friendships like that in the church? You know, they say the Western world has never been more lonely and isolated than it is right now. More isolation than there ever has been. Christians are brothers and sisters in Christ. We should also aim to be friends, close friends, friends that can trust each other, that, that actually intimacy begins to become natural. And we know we can trust them with this confession. We know they will pray for us. The church isn't to be just distant brothers and sisters in that regard. So the prayer is in, or the power is in the prayer, not the confession. Secondly, confession needs the draw of the gospel. In other words, we need the gospel to pull us towards Jesus. 
confession. If we rely simply on our sheer determination, it really won't happen. We need a greater motivation to be able to confess our sin to someone else. Naturally, as fallen humans, we do not confess our sin, not to God (laughs) and certainly not to other people. That's always been our default position. Think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they sinned and God came looking for them in the garden. They hid from God rather than confess their sin to God. What makes us do this? What makes us hide? Well, I can think of two things. Shame, the sense of shame, and the presence of pride. They're they're both very closely linked together, but we all know what it is to have that sense of shame. I've done it again, and I'm ashamed of it. But it's closely linked to pride sometimes, isn't it? We say, that's not what people think I am. And we're we're concerned with our image. We've built up a, a false righteousness or we're living out a false impression of our own righteousness. And it holds us back from confessing. We end up protecting our self image rather than confessing our sin. The sense of shame and the presence of pride restricts us. But the gospel says, the gospel calls to us, the gospel draws us, and it says, Jesus has borne my shame. That very shame that I'm experiencing right now, and I feel it, the gospel says, but James, it's no longer yours. Your saviour actually took that shame. He bore it on the cross for you. Yes, it's very real, but he carried it away. Have you got that? It's not something you have to live with. And that that self-righteousness of yours that lies in shatters on the ground in pieces. The gospel says, Jesus is my righteousness. Why was I trusting in that? Jesus has provided me the righteousness. Yes, I know that my righteousness is nothing. And so the gospel says, James, you can admit that you're not what you think you are that you've always been depending on the righteousness of Christ. And confession brings us to that place where we see our wretchedness and we see the glory of God. It brings into sharp focus and beauty and detail the cross of our Savior and the person of our Savior. And up until that point, it might have been a bit blurry, A bit like when you put some binoculars to your eyes and they're not set up for your eyes and and you look out and you know you're supposed to be looking at something beautiful but it's just a a, a blur and a smudge of grey and colour. And then you adjust them to your eyes and suddenly the scenery comes into sharp focus and you see the beauty. That's what confession does. It brings the gospel into sharp focus. And we are drawn and we can be drawn by the gospel to confess because we realize through the gospel that my security is in Christ, not in my reputation. I can see my sin. I can see my shame, but I can see my Savior as well. I can see his righteousness and I see my security. And I say, yes, I can confess. So the gospel is the answer to our sense of shame and the presence of pride. It draws us through them and says, don't let those things stop you from confessing. Instead, stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand on who you are in him. Be willing to acknowledge that you're not all you thought you were. And don't mind confessing that to someone else because that's the glory of the gospel for them too. 
They look at it and they say, yes, that's true. I'm going to join you in prayer because this is the reality that we're not living out and surviving on our performance. We're standing on the character of Christ. We're standing on his work. I can pray for you. You see, if we don't allow the gospel to draw us to confess our sin, we are in danger of remaining in our sin in silence. And that can destroy us when we are silent in our sin. We, we picked up on this, didn't we, in Psalm 32 that we read earlier. Blessed is the one, this is King David, the psalmist speaking. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. He knows what it is to be forgiven. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. But then he remembers a time when he kept silent. When I kept silent, look at the impact of silence over sin. My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped. David was affected spiritually and physically when he kept silent about his sin. Then... I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Dear brothers and sisters, let us not stay silent about our sin. We can waste away in that silence. Confess your sin to God. And if your, if your sin continues to hold you, even as you seek God and confess to him and you're still struggling with it, then confess it to one another that you might draw on the body of Christ, that you might receive help as God has designed it from amongst your brothers and sisters. Let them help you through prayer let them share the burden that you are going through. This is teamwork. This is fellowship. That's our third point. Confession is teamwork. It's how God's designed it. That's why he says in verse 16, confess your sins to one another. That's an expression of teamwork. Confession makes your struggle a team reality. You no longer are fighting your sin on your own in the shadows. You've brought your sin out into the open. Not to everyone, but you are walking in the light with a godly believer. And that is important. You have left hypocrisy behind. You have now, you're now in the light with one of your brothers or sisters. They know. Walking in the light means two things. We've already said one. You are being helped by powerful prayer. That's what happens when you walk in the light. Someone is praying. But you're also being helped with repentance. You're, you're being helped to, to move your confession to a real heart confession, a confession that has action. A confession where you turn, you see, true confession must have repentance at the end of the day. There must be a turning. That's what we saw in the parable of the lost son. He said, didn't he? He said it twice. He said, first, as he was in the mess he was in, he said, I have sinned. I will go and say I have sinned. And he got up and he went and he said, I have sinned. He turned. That's true confession. It's accompanied by action. That's why we say, please pray for me that this confession might lead to healing, to real turning. You see, history is filled with people who confessed and did not mean it. Think about Pharaoh, that king of Egypt. He said, I have sinned in dealing with the children of Israel. But he didn't turn. Balaam, that prophet 
who uh, the king of Moab wanted him to prophesy over the Israelites. He came to a place where he said, I have sinned, but he didn't turn. King Saul, the first king of Israel, he said, I have sinned, but he didn't turn. Judas, the friend of Jesus who betrayed him, he came to the place where he says, I have sinned, but he didn't turn. All their confessions proved empty. But that's not what we want. And that's why we come and we draw on a brother or sister. We confide and confess so that our confession might be a real confession. And so a a loving brother or sister would be willing to say to you, how is it going How is it going? Do you see that that loving accountability, that help? How is it going? I'm praying for you. How is it working out? How can I be praying for you? You're on the same team. So don't be defensive at that point. Don't become defensive that they might come and say, how is it going? Sometimes we want to. We want to go back to Eden. We want to hide But it's a loving question. Seek God's grace to respond. This is how it's going. Continue to pray. Help me. So I hope we can see that confession enables the church to live out an aspect of real fellowship that otherwise is missing. We are to confess our sins to one another at the appropriate time, for the appropriate reason, to the appropriate person, and that needs wisdom. But what would happen at HCC if we supported and leaned on each other in this way? If our battle with sin and Satan included confession to one another and real prayer and concern for each other, surely there would be a shift in our battle with sin. Finally, true confession leads to confession. This is what we've been saying. We're back at that circle we talked about at the start, how this wonderful circle can begin with the confession, I have sinned, and it climaxes in confessing, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. Remember, When the gospel draws you into confession of sin, it is leading you to confession of Christ. This is the constant cycle of confession that should be present in our lives. Confessing sin, seeing God's mercy and and love and grace, and so confessing him for who he is. Confessing sin, confessing Christ. Confessing sin, confessing Christ. Repenting of sin, praising God for his goodness. This is a cycle of the Christian all the way to glory. And we see that cycle um, in, in the children of Israel at the time of Nehemiah. We read this when we were going through Nehemiah recently. When all the people were gathered together, it says the Israelites assembled. They were fasting, wearing sackcloth, and had put on dust on their heads. And they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their ancestors. While they stood in their places, they read the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day and spent another fourth of the day in confession and worship of the Lord their God. They didn't stay in that kind of pit of confession. No, it leads to worship and praise. It leads to confessing Christ. We see they're joining in this wonderful cycle of confession that leads to worship. Well, I don't know whether in the school playgrounds right now or uh, even when we get back to school, 
whether they'll allow skipping to go on. But when I have distinct memories of going out into the playground and you'd see a couple of people with one of those long skipping ropes and they'd be going like this and people could join in and you might get a whole row, a line of people, kids jumping the, the rope together. And um, some people could do it better than others. And uh, once in a while, someone who really couldn't get in the rhythm of the skipping, they might get a friend who would kind of stand behind them and they would count them in and then they would jump in with them and they would keep them going in the rhythm. Well, let us help each other get into the cycle of confession in our lives. If one of us is struggling, maybe another can help us in this cycle and rhythm that really does um, result in a thriving Christian life. And if you're not a Christian this morning, if you haven't put your trust in Jesus Christ, this joyful cycle isn't exclusive. You're not outside. You don't have to be. You know, sometimes you'd go out into the playground and a group of children would be playing with their skipping rope and you'd go across and you would work out very quickly that you weren't welcome. This was just for a select amount of people who could skip well or something. That's not the way it is here. The cycle of confession is open to all people. Maybe this morning you don't know the joy of having your sins forgiven. Maybe you don't know uh, that reality of having your shame removed. Maybe you don't know what it is to have the righteousness, the perfection of Jesus credited to you, given a new slate, a clean bill before God. But you can know that joy. That's the point. Through trusting in Jesus, you can know these realities. The Bible calls you to confess your sin, to say to God, I have sinned against you, God. I believe that. I believe you are real, and I believe I'm a sinner, and I believe that my sin is primarily against you. You are the Holy One. And I realize that I'm a sinner that needs forgiveness. And you go on to say, and I believe in Jesus Christ. Christ, I believe that he came and he died and he rose again. I believe that he is a sacrifice for sin. I believe I can put my sin upon him by faith, that he can stand in my place and I can be forgiven. And then the Bible calls you to confess That Jesus not only lived and died and rose again, but that he is Lord and King of all things and that you will follow him and he will be your king. And the Bible says that whoever confesses their sin and confesses Jesus Christ as Lord shall be saved, shall be forgiven. They shall have eternal life. That is open to you. You can step in to the wonderful cycle of confession that brings you ever closer to knowing the one living God, his beautiful, deep character, knowing a relationship with him, which is one of father to child, forevermore, unshakable, This is what the world is longing for. And it comes to you through confession. So all of us this morning, the invitation is don't live in the shadows of unconfessed sin. Step into the light. Confess your sin to God and confess to one another. Amen.